Great. So thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk. Really excited about the Responsible Tech uh, Summit. It's a topic that's very close to my own heart and my own um, research. One of the things that I want to get across today, though, um, is that, you know, although there's quite a lot of talk in the community about ethics in technology, um, I feel like we, um, the, the challenge that we really have is that those conversations typically stay at a very high level. Um, so, you know, um, you know we, see, we see lots of people talking about kind of things that have gone wrong when technology has not taken values and ethics into account. But what we're really lacking, I think, in the software industry is some concrete guidelines and guidance about how we can actually properly embed um, things like ethics and values into technology. And that's hopefully what I'm going to be giving you a bit of a flavor about today, because that's some of the work that we've been doing at Monash University for the last three years. And um, before we do that, though, um, I mean, as I said, this talk is really going to be all about software. Um, it's the responsible tech summit, but at the end of the day, it's, it's you know, software that um, runs technology. So um, it's going to be mainly about the software methods that we use to develop technology or software engineering. And before talking about how we can embed values and ethics into software engineering, I think it's important to think about where it all started. And this is actually a photograph of a very, very famous conference in the software engineering community um, called the Garmisch Conference. It took place in 1968 in Garmisch, which is a, a place in Germany. And that was, uh, you know, the, the first time that the term software engineering had been used. And, and that conference had been brought together because there was a perceived crisis in the software industry. Um, you know, the software industry was going from, you know, making a transition from building very, very small programs to much larger scale programs. And they were really struggling with how to do that at scale in a way that um, things didn't break, things were robust, and things were reliable. And so this group of people got together to tackle that, and the term software engineering was coined. And so since then, we've, we've actually had 50 years of um, research and practice in software engineering. And that's led to lots of different methods and techniques, um, including agile methods that have taught us how we can develop software that is, you know, has the functionality that we want, a cost we can afford, that is reliable, that is usually safe, um, even um, nowadays takes into account relatively well things like security and more recently things like data privacy. But the point I want to make is that there's a massive, massive gap that's never really been addressed in software engineering and in the methods that we have which means that this is kind of the state of play that we're in right now, that the software engineering methods now, um, you know, give you good concrete guidance on how to deal with functionality, cost, safety, security, privacy, things like that. But when we start to talk about things like ethics or the phrase that I will use in this talk, um, human values, which are things like, you know, inclusion, diversity, responsibility, social responsibility, and being transparent, um, taking care of people's well-being, um, fairness, and respect. And um, we really don't have the software engineering methods to give us concrete guidance, concrete guidelines on how to deal with those kinds of things. You know, there's been some work um, done on those kinds of things over the years, and probably more in the design space rather than the software engineering space. But all of the methods that we've had in those 50 years have focused on um, you know, the safety, security, privacy, and much less on these values and, and ethics issues. And, and that's, I think, the shift that we, we need to make. And why do we need to make that shift? Well, because we can talk as long as we like about the importance of ethics in software. And I think most of us nowadays realize that that is an important thing, you know, with the various high profile cases of AI being biased and so forth. I think most people understand that thinking about ethics when we develop software is an important thing. But without concrete guidance, we put ourselves into a situation where, you know, take your average software developer, they're used to dealing with things 
like software requirements, which although, although often not perfect, um, give them, you know, you know, a specification of what it is that they're meant to build. And that those specifications, depending on what industry you're in, and depending on what method you're following, can be actually quite detailed. Um, so that it's, it's fairly well bounded about what the software engineers are, are meant to build. However, if we then ask them to think about ethics in software, we're giving them something that is very vaguely defined. Um, even the ethical frameworks that are now coming out from various governments across the world really don't give much concrete guidance to software developers about how to put ethics into their software. So you can take um, the Australian government's uh, AI ethics framework as an example there, which lays out eight principles um, for putting ethics into AI, but they're very, very, very high level. In fact, the, the, the third um, principle there is make sure that your software respects human values, but doesn't say what values how or how to do it. So that these frameworks really don't give you any idea how to do it. So you're left as a software developer with something that's very, very concrete on the one hand, your software requirements, and something that's very, very vague on the other hand, your ethics and values. And if you, you know, if you, you then have to choose between them, you you know, you have to put your time somewhere. So you're going to put your time on the on the more concrete things, the software requirements. So we really need to get to the point where those ethics and values are made much more concrete as well. Just a slight aside, because I've been using two words somewhat interchangeably so far, and that is values and ethics. Um, I put the word ethics in this talk just because that's a term that is often discussed in these kinds of forums, but I'm actually really going to talk about values for the rest of this talk. And the difference that I will make between values and ethics is that ethics are societally agreed norms um, about behavior, and they, they usually have a kind of moral connotation. Values, on the other hand, um, will include things that we normally think of as ethics, but also much broader than that. And if you want to know, you know, how to actually define values, you know, social scientists teach us how to do this. There's been decades of work actually about what values are. Um, probably the most widely referenced is a theory of human values by a social scientist called Schwartz, who did a survey in 82 different countries and came up with a theory of what people consider to be values. And these include the kind of things that we would normally talk about within, within the context of ethics. So, you know, inclusion, fairness, equality, diver, uh, diversity, and so forth. But they also include other things, um, you know, such as a sense of belonging or reputation or um, self-respect or even things like excitement and pleasure and ambition. So values are really just something that your, your stakeholders consider to be important. And in Schwartz's model, there's about 52 of these values. And if you actually look at which ones of those have been considered in the software engineering community, it's a very, very, very small number. It's just things like privacy and security. So we've done quite a bit of work over the last three years at Monash in trying to understand how we can properly embed values in software. And so the idea here is that as an organization or as a society, you have a certain set of human values. And you want your software to reflect that because the software um, is, is essentially a kind of a few organization. And so it, it should respect the values that you have. But the question is, how do you put those values into the software? Before we answer that question, however, we really need to look at what is the state of play in the software industry. Now, how do software developers think about values right now? Do they think about values? So we've done a number of studies where we've actually gone out into industry, we've interviewed um, practitioners in the software industry um, in a range of different roles that, uh, you know, all the way from kind of CIOs to uh, software testers kind of working very much at the call face. And we've discovered a number of things. Um, the first thing that we've discovered is that software developers on the ground really don't consider things like ethics and values to be their responsibility. You know, they, if you ask them, they will, they will think that values are important. They will think that it's important to put values in software, but they will say things like, oh, that's above my pay grade. That's really for the CEO to think about. That's not my job. Um, and of course it is their job, 
values and ethics really need to be considered um, at all levels of an organization for them to be taken seriously. And this actually, um, this tallies quite well with some other studies that have been done across the world. So there's a study that was done by um, a professor in Vienna called Sarah Spiekerman, and she found that 40% of software developers don't even consider things like privacy their responsibility. And privacy is a value that gets a lot of media time, a lot of airtime. So once we then start thinking about other values like you know, self-respect or fairness or equality, you can imagine that developers are just not thinking about those things at all. So I think there's quite a shift that needs to be made. If we look at how different software companies are dealing with things like values, we do see a very, very wide spectrum of what I call values maturity. So this is how mature are they in their thinking about values. And that can range, that can range from completely immature, you know, they, they don't think about value at all, it just doesn't come into the conversation. And you can go to the other end of the spectrum where they're actually very mature, and we have seen companies like this. Um, so they might have something, you know, they might have a values charter that um, concretely lays out what their values are. They might take that, that, that values charter into account when they hire employees, so they know that whoever they hire is well aligned with their values. Um, and they might even, you know, they might do various kind of training and they might even have um, specific mechanisms within their software development processes so that people are given an opportunity to raise questions about the values of the software. But there's a very, very wide spectrum in terms of the different organizations. One thing we have found is that currently, even where companies are doing values well, it's typically um, thought of as a cultural issue. So it's typically thought of the kind of thing that, you know, uh, the CEO should set a value statement and then um, that should be kind of trickled down through cultural things such as training and how you hire people and so forth. But it's much less thought of as, say, a technical issue. You know, what are the actual concrete design patterns, the design guidelines? What are the concrete methods that embed those values? Um, that's really just not there. That's, that's, that's a big gap. And we've also found that a very small subset of values are considered in practice right now. So you remember that I said earlier that in the Schwartz model, there are about 52 different values. Um, but we've, it's really only about five or six of those that you'll find being seriously considered in the software industry right now. And the, the, the more obvious ones that are considered such as security, privacy, accessibility, and things like that. And even if we move away from um, practice and look at research, which you, you might expect to find more um, talk about values. Cutting edge research in software engineering hardly considers values at all in software. So we did a study of the last five years of publications in software engineering research, and we found that only 16% of that research um, considers values at all. Um, if you actually take security out, which does get a lot of attention, you'll find that only about 10% of that research actually considers values at all. So I think in terms of where we actually are in the software industry and also in software research, we've still got quite a long way to go before we're gonna be considering values and ethics on a day-to-day -day basis. That takes me to the next part of the talk. So what we've been doing at Monash um, is we've actually been trying to um, come up with new software methods that do give practitioners concrete guidance on how to put values and ethics into their software. And we've been doing that specifically to, in the context of agile methods. So we've been, we've been trying to adapt um, some of the well-known agile methods and put values in there. And it turns out that um, this, this, you know, this is, this is a, probably one of the easiest methods to, to try to do that with. Agile by its nature is very people focused. And of course, values are very pe people focused as well. So it's much easier to do this in agile methods than say some other methodologies. But the good news and the kind of main point that I want to make um, today is that when we first started this work, we thought that we would need to create a complete revolution in the software industry. You know, that we would have to come up with completely new methods that think about values and get software developers to think in a very, very different way because it was such, uh, you know, as we've seen, it was just not being considered and it was such a, a new thing. The good news, however, is that we found that we don't actually need a revolution, we just need evolution. And in particular, some of the agile methods that we've got can be adapted or tweaked fairly simply 
you find places where you can think about values, consider values, and put values into, your, um, into the way that you design software. And here are some of those ways. So this is a, there's a lot more to this. There's many papers that we're, we're writing about this. But this is at a very, very high level. Some of the ways that we found that you can adapt Agile um, to think specifically about values at all points in your Agile methodology. And again, this was based on some concrete studies, um, in this case with two companies that were using Agile and we worked with them to look at where values um, could be introduced as intervention points in, the, in their Agile methodologies. So I've broken this down into how could you change four um, different parts of the Agile methodology, so artifacts, roles, ceremonies, and culture. So if we just look at artifacts first, so you know, Agile, as any um, method, produces lots of different artifacts. Um, to deal with values properly, you, you, you either need to introduce new artifacts or you need to adapt some of the artifacts that you already have. So in terms of introducing new artifacts, we're suggesting that you actually have a concrete values statement, which says, you know, for that project, here are the values that we consider to be important. And they will vary from project to project. It will vary from organization to organization. And there are ways to, to come up with those value statements. You could start with that Schwartz model, for example, of those 52 values and think about which, which three or four or five of those are more important in the context of that project. And then you need to make them more concrete and make something very high level like fairness and talk about you know, what fairness means in the context of that specific project to your specific end users, customers, stakeholders, and so forth. The other um, artifact that we consider is very important. So lots of agile methods use um, user stories to essentially define the user, the user requirements. And we think that they can be very easily adapted into something that we call value stories. So these are just the same things as user stories where you might define um, some feature that you're trying to implement, but you also include statements about the values that are important in that. So it might be um, you're designing an interface, but you're doing it in an inclusive way, for example. And this is a very, very simple thing. I hope to give you a quick example of this um, later, just so you can see what it looks like. In terms of roles, so roles, are, again, are very important in Agile. People take on different roles and responsibilities, and that's what makes the whole thing work. And we found that you, to deal with values in Agile, you, you need to introduce new roles. So one of the roles that you need is what we call a, a values champion, or we sometimes call that role a critical friend. And this is somebody who part of their job is to make sure that values are being discussed at all stages of the development. Um, and so they will take things like those value statements and those value stories. And if the team seems that they're not properly thinking about those, they will kind of raise their hand and say, wait a minute, um, we can't design the software in that way because it's not consistent with those values that we've defined. And related to that, we found that a useful role would be something that we call a values translator, which could be the same person as a values champion, but it doesn't need to be. The values translator is someone who is able to bridge the two worlds of um, you know, the, the kind of vague ethics and values and the very, very concrete technical world of software design. So somebody that can actually say, well, you know, value, uh, the value of fairness is important, but what does fairness mean in our particular context? What does it mean on this particular um, piece of code? Um, and so that person is actually quite important. Agile, of course, has lots of different ceremonies, so retrospectives and planning increments and, and so forth. And what we're suggesting is to properly deal with values, you need to put those values into those ceremonies. So when you're planning your next increment, for example, or when you're taking your next piece of work off the backlog, um, don't just prioritize based on you know, minimum viable product or you know, what is cheapest or what is most important to the customer, but you know, make sure you're making those prioritization decisions also taking into account what you've said your values are, because otherwise your values won't be prioritized. Similarly, when you're doing your retrospective, so put aside part of your retrospective to actually look back and say, how true were we to our value statements here? How well did we implement those values that we set out in our value stories? And there's also a mechanism that you can use, which we're calling a third pillar core, which actually comes from one of the companies that we work with, 
Um, the reason it's called a third pillar call is because that company had um, values as its third pillar in its value statement. And this is just a, a chance where the project team just kind of takes time aside for a special meeting specifically to talk about those values. So you, so you might schedule these at particular points um, during, a, um, during a sprint, for example, um, so that you don't just, you know, you take, you take that time to just step back from the kind of day-to-day -day development and discuss, you know, what impact your design decisions are having on those high-level values that you set for yourself. And then, of course, there's a whole culture piece. And in fact, we had a talk in Responsible Tech yesterday, um, pretty agile, talking exactly about culture in agile. And that's obviously very important here. So how do you create a culture where values can be um, talked about um, freely? So you need that psychological safety that people can raise issues. And you need to make sure that you're training people according to your values and hiring for your values and so forth. So those are the kind of the four pieces that, we're, that we think we can actually fairly easily adapt um, agile methods to bring these values in. Now I'm gonna, just cause I wanted to make, just got a promise at the beginning I would make this very concrete. I'm just gonna run you quickly through um, how you might do these values stories things. Um, so if you're not a, a, an agile person, um, you don't need to worry too much about the terminology that I'm using here. Um, this is uh, something that in agile circles is called an epic, but it's it's just you know a description of a new project. That's what you, what you can think about it. Here it's an HR system that's allowing a HR professional to quickly assess and prioritize online job applications as they come in, and then communicate those decisions to applicants. So this is what a classical epic or project description might look like um, that you give to the team. And then they would break those down into user stories. So these are features that they're going to implement, but from the user perspective. So in this case, the user is an assessor of applications and they need um, functionality that will allow them to view all relevant details of an application so they can make proper decisions. And you'd go through and you'd create a whole bunch of those user stories. And then you'd have something called the product backlog, which is where you prioritize these things. And you might say, in this case, for whatever reason, that user story one, user story one is more important than two, is more important than three. And so then you'd pull user story one off the stack and you'd go away and implement that. And then you'd, you'd iterate on that process. And that's how a kind of, that's a very, very high level. That's how a kind of standard agile process works. Now let's think about though, about how it would work in this new world where we're actually considering values. So the first thing you need to do is to get your value statement. So for this epic or for this project, what values are important? And again, there's different ways you can do that. You can start with the Schwartz values and kind of narrow them down. Um, you can have um, uh, facilitated meetings where you get different stakeholders together and agree on those values. Then you'd then what we're suggesting you do is you actually go back to your, um, your, doc your documented epic and user stories and you start to look at those through a values lens. So you put a values hat on, if you like, and you say, okay, given these values that we've defined, what, how do we need to change those user stories so that the, the values part is actually evident? And that's really the, the essence of this whole method because values are often, even when they are thought about, they're often thought about very implicitly so what this simple technique allows you to do is to make those values very explicit when you're developing the software and when you're um, going through your various um, design methods. And by making it explicit, that means that there's less chance that you're going to forget about them and you're going to design the software in a way that doesn't respect those values. So once you've done that, you would actually go back and prioritize your product backlog um, with this, again with this values hat on. So just to very, very quickly show how this might be done. Of course, I could give a lot, much longer talk on this, but in this HR system, you might say, well, my values are inclusiveness. I don't want to discriminate against different types of um, applicants. But another value might be respect. You know, I want to make sure that I get back to candidates who have applied within a reasonable amount of time and provide them with useful feedback. So that's your value. And then you would then go in and you'd look at your ethics with your values hat on or your values lens. And the, the, the words in red are things that you would add to your epic here that relate to those values. So you are saying that you will communicate decisions respectfully in a timely fashion. That relates to your respect value, regardless of their gender, ethnicity, or physical mental challenges. So that relates to your inclusiveness. 
um, value. And you'd go all the way through your user stories. And in fact, one of the little techniques that we like to use in our making these user stories into value stories um, is to add the words feel like there. So user stories typically have a standard um, format. It's as a user, I want to do this so that I can do that. And we're saying add a little bit to that and add at the end so that I feel like. Um, and and that's, a, that's a good simple way of just um, relating it to these values. So in this case, we've put in uh, so that I, the assessor of applications feels like they've treated everyone fairly. So they've put that um, inclusiveness value in there. And by doing this, you also it enables you to just be a little bit more concrete about what inclusive actually means. So here it might mean, for example, that if someone's taken a period of time off because of um, parenting duties, that you take that into account when you prioritize the applications. And so you keep going through like this, and then you might actually um, reprioritize your product backlog now that you've got these new user stories. So in this case, for example, you might take that first user story and actually split it into two and have one where you're um, focusing on user interface features specifically for that value of inclusiveness. And then you might reprioritize your backlog and say, well, that, that inclusiveness user story is more important than another user story. And so we'll implement that one first. So what this does, um, it kind of brings values into Agile through the back door, if you like. We're not going in um, the companies and saying you have to completely, you know, radically change the way that you do Agile. Um, that wouldn't work. What we're doing is saying that, you know, you've got a particular way that you do Agile. If you just add these tweaks in these particular places, you'll get a much better handle on things like ethics and values and putting that into your software so that you're developing responsible technology. So just to finish off, this is my final slide. I think it's always important to ask the following question when we talk about responsible technology. And that is, what is the value of values? So it's all very well to say, you know, let's put values or let's put ethics into software. Um, and, and we can all kind of agree with that, with the fact that the software industry has a moral obligation to do this. We've seen enough examples where, it, where it's gone wrong. Um, but I think we mostly agree that we have a moral obligation. But unfortunately, having a moral obligation is often not enough um, when it comes to convincing boards or CEOs or even developers that we should do this. So I think there need, needs to be um, other reasons to do this as well. Um, there's been a lot of talk at this conference about kind of regulating ethics. So that's certainly going to be um, part of the, the puzzle here. Um, but I would also say that values can actually give you a competitive advantage in certain cases. So you can you can segment your markets and you can create a niche market based on the fact that you um, focus on a particular value um, in a way that your competitors don't. And of course, um, I think it's important to make the link between values and financial implications, um, because the fact of the matter is that if you don't implement software that considers values, that could have very, very negative financial implications on your business at the end of the day. So there's actually a, an economic reason to do this. And the, the classic example of this is the Volkswagen emissions scandal, um, where they basically went against their own corporate value um, of accountability um, by deliberately circumventing um, emissions regulations. And that, of course, had very, very serious economic um, implications for that company. Um, but those financial implications don't have to be quite so dramatic as that. Um, they, they can happen in smaller ways to all kinds of different companies and all kinds of different organizations. So I think I'll finish there. And I think we still have a little bit of time for questions, if there are any. Well done, John. That's fantastic. Um, and I think that whole idea of the evolution uh, rather than the revolution it really is is really interesting. I'm just wondering, um, you brought up then the whole idea of profit maybe overriding uh, people's, you know, um, values. The other constraints we often hear about is time to market um, and and people feeling the pressure to to ship. Um, have you found that that's, you know, another uh, another thing that sort of stops people with this evolution to to sort of look at values? Yeah, so it's definitely a consideration. I think it, it, it plays out differently depending on what kind of software organization you're looking at. So 
you know, if, if, if I was to um, start a consultancy company that would teach companies how to do values in this way, um, I wouldn't start, for example, with startups. Um, they, you know, they, 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 they're just small outfits just trying to, you know, make ends meet, get to market faster than their competitors. Uh, maybe they should be thinking about values, but they just don't have the, the, the mind space for it. Um, so that that's probably a longer term, um, you know, uh, proposition. But you know, you can you can start with um, you know larger software houses um, or larger organizations, you know, the Telstra's of the world that you know do have the resources to actually consider these things and and um, you know more kind of frameworks in place to actually consider these things. There's been a question from Andrew Sims. Uh, why do you think the software community zeroed in on privacy and security in particular? And is there any learning from this in how we might go about having more values included in the future? I, I think you answered some of that, but maybe you want to, to yeah, sure. talk to that. Yeah, well, it's actually quite interesting if you look at the history of software engineering. So in the early days of software engineering, of course, they didn't consider privacy at all. They didn't even consider security at all. And if, if you take security, um, when they first started thinking about security, it was very much considered as an add-on. So you build your software and then you try and make it secure. And they realized that that didn't work and that you needed to consider security from day one, you know, even in your, your requirements process and in your design process and through the implementation. And then it was a similar kind of thing with privacy. So we've now got privacy by design where you consider privacy from day one, but the first efforts at privacy weren't like that. It was, well, we've got a secure piece of software. How do we now deal with data privacy? Um, so what you find, what, what we're finding with this history of software engineering is that, you know, every, I don't know, 10 years or something, there's a, there's a new value that they then try and add on. And when they initially tried to add that on, it tends to be a kind of post hoc thing. And then they realized that they need to, to do it um, from the very early stages of the software lifecycle. Why privacy? I, probably just because there was a lot of things that went wrong with privacy. So there was a lot of media interest around that and therefore, you know, a lot of um, economic um, implications for that. So hopefully we'll see new layers of values added to that stack um, one by one. I think we're already starting to see the seeds of some of that. You know, there's the values like, um, you know, even, in, even gender diversity that's becoming very important. Um, and inclusion and things like inequality and things like that. So hopefully we'll see the same trend continue. There's been a couple of comments and questions around that whole idea of the values translator or champion. Um, Amber uh, Case suggested it might be the role of a philosopher or artist to ask questions. And Laura Summers has asked, have you seen any instances of companies carving out a new role? Um, yes. for a values translator and can you see this as a new capability for existing roles? Yeah, that's very good questions. Um, there definitely are cases of companies that I have tried to do this. Um, there's one company that we work with that have, have done this, but you know, there's also big companies like Microsoft of the world that um, I think I forgot his title, but there is, um, I think, an ethics person who's VP for something or other. Um, at very highest levels of the company. Um, I would actually argue though, that um, you shouldn't view that values champion um, as saying, you know, let's get a philosopher in here or let's get a social scientist in here. Um, we, I've done a lot of work over the years in multidisciplinary teams. And one of the problems you can have when you try to bring, you know, social scientists or philosophers together with let's say computer scientists, is that they think in very, very, very different ways and you end up with a lot of conflict. So if you bring a philosopher into the team who doesn't really understand how software is developed, you know, you risk actually creating more problems than you're solving because you're going to end up with a lot of conflict where the philosopher is saying, oh, we really need to take into account, you know, this, but they're not able to express themselves in a way that the developers can really understand. So you actually need to find a person who who understands both worlds and I understand there's, there's fewer of those around and I think that probably then leads to the fact that we actually need to educate people in a different way um, because uh, you know the way that we, we we educate software developers right now they don't get that that, that kind of understanding. Um, 
think we might start leaving it there. Um, the, the rains ha uh, come in Sydney, so uh, I can hear rain, which is it makes your backdrop even more enticing. Uh, yeah. John, I know that we're planning to involve some of your colleagues from uh, Monash uh, at the Agile Australia conference in October to talk more about how some of these things can be embedded. But you're off on a new adventure soon. You're joining Data 61 um, to head it up. Are you, are you looking forward to that? Yeah, I'm going to be the new director of Data 61 um, in a little over a month now. So 27th of July, I, I start that role. So it's a, it's a wonderful organization, part of CSIRO, of course, and we'll no doubt be um, doing a lot of this kind of stuff there because they, they, they've already had a, a large hand in uh, developing that um, AI ethics framework that I talked about earlier. Well, we hope to continue the conversation with you. I know there were lots more questions, so I'm sorry we didn't get to them. But um, I think uh, hopefully if Responsible Tech happens next year, we'll, we'll have you sharing more about what you're up to. So all the best. Thank you so much. Thanks very much.